Well, this morning is a follow-up to last week's message. You got a lot of response in the last week's message talking about in God we trust. One of the mottos that we have that's embedded within the coins and also printed on our currency. Well, the Lord just spoke to my heart this week and said, well, listen, let's just go ahead and do a follow-up, but with kind of a different perspective. Uh, one of the things that's really hit me, not only as we face what we're facing in our nation at this moment, is also something that is embedded within our pledge of allegiance to the United States of America. Embedded within that is what? One nation under God. Now, I would love to tell you that where I stand this morning, from what I can see, that we are one nation under God. But that is not the case. We are a nation that is divided. Would you not agree with me, church? And I'm not talking about political parties. What I'm talking about is we are a nation divided on those that would have nothing and want nothing to do with God, and then there's a group that calls themselves, notice I put quotation marks around it, that calls themselves followers of Jesus Christ, which is... We call them Christians, right? We call ourselves a Christian, and to dissect that word, it means to be Christ-like. There, there are a lot of folks that call themselves Christians who are not Christians, okay? Because if you're a Christian, it means that you've come to a moment in your life when you've confessed your sin before Jesus Christ, realizing that you could not save yourself, that what Jesus Christ did on the cross and giving of himself for you, you believe that, you accept that, you call upon him for his forgiveness, knowing that he is the only one that has the power to do that. And at that moment that we confess our sins, we repent. The word of God says repent is a turning away. We repent and we call him our Lord and our Savior. We're given the gift of eternal life. And from that moment on, our desire is to be Christ-like. The Apostle Paul says that to be Christ-like is to strive every day to be and to live in the righteousness of God. Amen, church? Which means we have a desire to grow in the Word of God. So, one nation under God. I'll tell you what my prayer is. My prayer is that there will be an awakening of the church. When I say the church, the church is the body of believers. The church is not a building. It's not a place. In fact, many of you this morning are not in this house, but you're worshiping with us. Therefore, the church has come together, not only physically, but also across the airways to do what? To worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church, the body of Christ. My prayer is, is that the church will take its stand. Isn't it amazing as he was sharing that testimony of those two who were united in communism, right? Can you imagine that? United in communism. I, I love what you said there, that there was that bond that brought them together. You know, the bond that brings us together in a relationship should be Jesus Christ because that's a relationship that will grow our marriage. But yet when they accepted Jesus Christ, it changed their life. Changed their life so much that they were sold out for Jesus Christ that he became a pastor and therefore was able to get and do the work of God and, and seeing the lives change because of what Jesus can do. Amen? Jesus can change a life. So my prayer is, is that we will again become a nation under God. Well, the title of this message this morning is The Time Is Now. And uh, how many of you know what an acrostic is? Anybody know what an acrostic is? An acrostic is where you take a word and uh, you take various, uh, you take uh, the first letter of that word and you build another word or you build a sentence out of it. So the message this morning is the time is now. One nation under God. And you're going to see where this message goes this morning as a follow-up to last week's message because I believe it speaks to you both on a personal level where you are in your relationship or where you are not in your relationship with Jesus Christ? And then where are you as a follower of Jesus Christ? Where do you, when it comes to, as we talk about being a nation under God, where are you in your values, your moral code, your moral compass? Where are you in looking at, as we're in this election year, where are you in looking at the policies, those things that a you know, that a politician will bring up that they want you to vote for them. Where are you in dissecting what he or she is submitting to you to examine and comparing it to the Word of God? How does that fall into play with where you're at as a follower of Jesus Christ? And again, I submit to you, as I submitted to you last week, take a look at the Word of God. And look at the Word of God as it relates to those things that are being promoted or pushed 
from politicians and see where they line up with your thoughts. It's not ever about a person. It's always going to be where I take my stand as a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why I believe now is the time for us to be one nation under God. So if you would this morning, if you'll follow along with me, if you have your bulletin, there are some great places within that to take some notes. You are going to need a copy of God's Word. If you do not have one, slip your hand up. We have one free for you. If this morning you are tuning in with us online, you don't have the Word of God there with you, take a quick moment, just push the pause button, run, grab the Word of God, and then come back. Don't forget to take me off mute, all right? And then we're going to come back together, and we're going to dissect the Word of God. So the very first verse I want to give you this morning, now is the time, comes from this verse, found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, and this is what it says. It says, Behold. Now that's a powerful word. What does it mean, behold? In other words, it's like, hey, listen, listen to me. This is very important. Don't miss this. And it goes on and it says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the time of your salvation. Again, there are two points that I want you to get out of this message this morning. Of course, the Holy Spirit may give you several more, but I believe these are the, at least the two that I want you to see. And the first one is this. I want you to see where you are at in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, you are either a follower of Jesus Christ, you are either a Christian, as we use that term, or you are not. You're either one or the other. There, there, there's not another choice for you to make. You've either accepted Jesus Christ or you have not. So that's very important for you to think about that this morning. Where are you in your relationship with God this morning? The second thing is, is where are you in your relationship in following Jesus Christ within your family, within your community, and within our country, and within the world? Are you one of those when someone meets you, they'll know something is different by the way you talk and by the way you act? Are you just another follower of the crowd. You see, a Christian always stands out. We talked about this last week. We are the ones that are to be the salt and the light of the world. If y'all remember last week, I told you that we went to the Deer Lodge, and there's nothing like putting on some salt on a good steak. Well, that illustration was so good to me, I had to go again this week to the Deer Lodge and have me a steak and put some salt on it. There's just something that brings the flavor of the meat out. And there's something about a follower of Jesus Christ that brings the flavor of Christ into the world that can make a difference in your life, in the life of your family, in the life of the community, and in the life of the world. Well, the first point that I'm going to have for you this morning as we look at the word time, that's the acrostic I'm going to use. And I thought about time. How many of you would agree with me that there are three things about time that never change? Number one, time has history right? Time has the present where we're at right now, and time has the future. Now, here's what's really cool about this. We are right now living in the present, right? In fact, the very words I just spoke that were in the present are now in the history. Let your mind think about that for a moment. Think about this. The very present right now will be tomorrow's history, and tomorrow is going to be the future of time. Yes or no? It's interesting. There's history, there's the present, and then there is the future. How many of you would agree with me that time never changes? Right? Someone posted this past week, and they said, on time, if you could have your choice, what would you want? And I, I posted back to him, I said, I would want to fast forward. How many of you would like, just get out of this mess right now and move on to 2021? Right? Just hit the fast forward button, let's move on. We can't do that, can we? We cannot jump into the car, the DeLorean, and go back to the future or go to the present. How many of you would like to do that? I'd love to have one of those DeLoreans that would change time. Amen? Time is constant. It never changes. You can't make a minute go faster, and you can't slow a minute down. Although there are times in life we feel as if it is slowed down. So the reality is I can't have yesterday back. I can't change anything about the past. I'm in the present right now. What I can learn from my past can affect my present, yes or no? What I can learn from my past that affects my present, if God should tarry and give me tomorrow, it can be the catalyst that takes me to tomorrow and does some great things in my life. I was thinking about time, and there are a couple of time pieces. Now, I cannot pronounce the name of the most expensive watch. Last year in 2019, it was called a Philip um, 
uh, whatever the name of that thing. Can you pronounce it, John? A pat- patri or something like this. It sold in Geneva for $31 million. A watch for $31 million. It surpassed a Daytona Rolex that was, ro- that was worn by Paul Newman. That was the most expensive watch at that time that sold for $17.7 million. Now I'm going to show you my favorite watch. It sold for $49. Back in 1981. This is my favorite watch. It's a Seiko. Why is this my favorite watch? Because it was given to me when I graduated from the Highway Patrol Academy. And I cannot tell you how many stories, if this watch could tell stories, could tell you about my almost 30-year career in law enforcement. And I keep this watch. Not because it's worth a lot of money. In fact, if it was to be going on the auction block today, I would dare say no one would give $30 million because at one time, Marty Duncan wore this watch. But it's very special to me. And you know what? This watch, it's an automatic. Do you know it still keeps time? I need to get a little, little link here for it and fix it. But I just kind of keep it in my keepsake because it's very special to me and I don't want to lose it. And then I have this other watch. This is kind of cool. Yesterday I went on a motorcycle ride. And I looked down on my little Harley watch that sits, or my little Harley clock that sits on my um, uh, handlebars there, and, and I noticed it said, and it's still saying, 12 o'clock. I knew it wasn't 12 o'clock because I left the house at 8 o'clock. I knew that the battery was dead in my clock. Now, I will say that this is a very expensive little piece only because it's got the Harley logo on it. Nothing special about it, but it's special to me because it sits on my motorcycle and it tells me what time it is. Why is time important? Because time tells us, that time piece tells us where I need to be and what time I need to be there, right? How many of you have a watch on this morning? Yeah. And you, you know, it's funny because in church, everybody has a watch on. <laughs> you know, it's the only place I can go where everybody's got a watch on. Why is that? Because we're keeping track of time and how long you're going to speak. I have a clock up here and I've told them to throw it away. Why is time important to us? Because we know we can't have it back. So this morning I want to talk to you about time and I want to use it as an acrostic. Here's my first word. The first word is turn. The first word is turn. It's time. If you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day for you to turn your life over to Him. There is no better time than right now. And I will promise you the very moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your life will forever change. How do I know that be true? Because that's what happened in my life. At that moment that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, my life changed. I have hope. One of the things I have also learned about time and and knowing that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I have no fear of time. How many of you fear death? Come on, be honest with me. How many of you, you say, well, Marty, I'm not going to raise my hand. I'm not that fool. There are so many folks that I have met that fear death. I have no fear of death. Uh, One of the things that I have here is this this measuring stick. How many of you have ever seen one of these? This is really old-fashioned, is it not? And uh, I think it's 70-some inches. Maybe it's a little bit longer than that. And in each one of these little turns represents time to me. Now, sooner or later, time is going to run out. The Word of God says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. That's very clear. We know death is a surety unless Jesus comes back at our time of living. We know death is a surety. So if you look at the end of this, zero starts, it's actually 71 inches. Zero starts here, right? And then each increment's an inch, and it goes up to 71 inches. Now, when it runs out, that's it. Sooner or later, we're going to run out of time. Amen? How many of you are trying to preserve that? Come on, be honest with me. How many of you are taking vitamins? You take vitamins to preserve time, to make, make life a little bit special, right? Um, some, of you, uh, some of you go and get, uh, get Botox to do away with those. Some of you are looking at me and smiling. To get rid of the wrinkles because wrinkles are a testimony of time, right? Let me tell you what. I've earned every one of my wrinkles, and I'm not getting rid of any of them. Amen? They're a testament of time. So here's what I'm saying to you is... In Jesus Christ, I have no fear of time here on this earth because I have been given the promise of an eternal life. You see, this is just a short destination to the final outcome in Jesus Christ that I have with him. So this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day to turn your life over to him. Let me just share a couple verses with you. They're up on the screen. You can look these up later. You can follow along. There are several, but I'm just going to share a few this morning. 
Acts 26, verse 20, it says, they, that they should repent and turn to God. For those that don't know Jesus Christ, now is the time to repent and turn to God. Now's the time to turn to the Lord. Forgiveness and cleansing can be yours when we repent and commit our life to God. Now is the time to turn our eyes to Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, 9, it says this. Notice this. If we, put your name in there, if Marty, if Susan, if I confess my sins, he, being Jesus Christ, is faithful to forgive my sins, right? To faithful and righteous to forgive my sins and to what? Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You see, that very moment I was born, I was born into a sinful life. I was born into sin. Sin brings about death. It causes death. It causes a separation from God. Therefore, if I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, and I call upon his name, confess my sins to him, ask him to be my Lord and Savior, what's it say there? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In Hebrews chapter 12, too, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the Father. Why did Jesus go to the cross? This is kind of an amazing verse here. It says that Jesus found joy in going to the cross. How in the world could any find, anyone find joy in the torment of what the cross was going to bring? Because God fulfilled, in Jesus Christ, fulfilled the payment of sin that needed to be made through His Son, Jesus Christ, by going to the cross. And Jesus knew that by following the Father's will, in fulfilling His will, going to the cross, there would be joy in those that could find salvation in Jesus Christ. The joy of the cross. The joy of the Lord. That's why we hear this verse that says, it's one of my favorites, the joy of the Lord becomes my strength. So this morning... I challenge you, I challenge you, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time. You may never have this opportunity again. Don't waste a moment. Don't waste an opportunity. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Confess your sins before him. Call him and ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. And you know what? He won't turn you away. He won't turn you down. Jesus Christ came for everyone. For all of us. Doesn't matter how bad you think you are. Doesn't matter how good you think you are. I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ came to the cross for you. And now is the time to make that confession of faith and accept Him as Lord and Savior. So, the first letter is T, in time. And it's so important for us to turn our life over to Jesus Christ. And then the next one is I, in that word, time. Invest in the Lord. Guess what you're doing this morning? You are investing in the Lord. Today we're following an act of obedience that tells us to gather together as the body of Christ, to come together, to unite with one another, to have fellowship with the body of Christ, for prayer, for praise, and to worship, and to grow in the Word of God. This is just only one opportunity that we have here at Fellowship of the Hills to come and to worship together, whether it be in the house or whether it be online. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, I invest in the Lord. Notice what it says here in Acts chapter 26, verse 20. It says that they should re repent and turn to God. So that moment I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I turned from the ways of the world. I turned from my selfish desires. You say, well, Marty, how did that happen? It was the power of the Holy Spirit that changed my life that very moment that I accepted Jesus Christ. It's kind of like the grass got greener. The birds sang, you know, sweeter. There's just something about knowing that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, that he loves me so much, that by his grace and mercy, he cares for me. And I want to invest in him as he invests in me. So I turn and I follow him. Notice this. It says, now is the time to turn to the Lord. Forgiveness and cleansing are ours. You don't have that up there, the right one, right? Put the invest one up there, that slide. They're back there. They're sleeping on me. Here we go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. It says, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your what? There your heart is. Where's your treasure at this morning? Is your treasure in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is your treasure in things of this world? How many of you have a car? How many of you got anything that's got a motor on it? You know one of the great things about buying a new car? It comes with a warranty. How many of you ever drive your car like it's got a warranty? 
right? When you have the warranty, you drive it and you could care less because you know if during that 36-month period, you can take it back and they're going to fix it. And then all of a sudden, after that 36 months, you become a little bit more cautious in how you drive your car because you're praying nothing breaks down, right? Isn't that something? Why do we do that? Because we know it's not going to last. Things on this earth do not last. They're going to rust. They're going to decay. But you know what? Those things that we invest in the Lord, what do we invest in? Investing in the lives of others. One of the greatest things is to go share Jesus Christ with someone else and to see their life change. And not only their life change, but by that person receiving Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, can it change their relationship with their spouse? Yes or no? Can it change the relationship with their children? Can it change their relationship with their family? Can it change the relationship in their community? Yes or no, church? Absolutely it does. So I want my treasures to be laid up not on the things of this earth, but in the lives of others. You see, God demands first place in our life. What is one of the commandments? The very Ten Commandments that we have, what does it say? It says, you'll have no other God before you, right? Now, how many of us, don't raise your hand, how many of you have other gods before him? He said, well, Marty, I'm not going to be foolish and raise my hand. Think about it. There are some that are not here this morning, and I'm going to be very tender in this because they have other gods before them. Yes or no? So, well, Marty, we're not going to agree with you either. Listen, the camera's only watching me. It doesn't see you. The reality is this, anything, listen, anything we put before God becomes a God. Are you listening to me, church? And he says, we're not to have any other gods before him. So we want to invest in the Lord as he continues to invest in us. Earthly treasures will not last, but spiritual treasures are of eternal value. As Jonathan shared a moment ago, these two folks that came to know Jesus Christ, what are they doing? They're sold out to Jesus Christ, and they are investing their lives into the lives of others by sharing Jesus with others. Guess what? I love what you said there. Won't it be great when we get to heaven and to see all those that we had the opportunity to share Jesus with, to plant the seed, to water the seed, to have been there when they accepted Jesus Christ, and know that we had a part in that. And know that they had a part in being with us and worshiping with us. What a great opportunity for us to invest in the lives of others. Notice what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. It says, instruct those who are rich in the present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. I talked about the car a moment ago. We have an uncertainty of the things that we have. I mean, does anybody have anything that you believe it's going to last forever? We've got a water heater that we put in the house, and, and we're getting ready to hit that five-year mark. And as I say that, I pray, Lord, please keep it running. It's one of those Insta water heaters. It wasn't cheap, but when we bought the house, we put it in. It's going to be year five. And you all know what happens when that year comes, right? It's going to break. I mean, you just accept it, right? But you know what happens is if we're not careful, we, we fix our eyes on the things that we have, thinking they're going to last forever. Notice what he says here. He says, we fix our eyes on the hope of the uncertainty of those things, uncertainty of the riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to glory. We need to fix our eyes on God and all those things that he supplies and he gives us. Let me tell you one thing that never, that'll never run out in my relationship with Jesus Christ, the joy that I have in him. How is it that I can face uncertain times? How is it that though I may hear the word cancer, which I have heard, how is it that we can hear other things? And, and how is it that we can have joy? And be, it's because we know the certainty of God in our relationship that we have in him. Amen, church? You, you see, I invest in the Lord as he invests in my life. And I want to share that with others. I want to bring others to that saving grace of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, there's another part of this word, and it's the M word. So we have turn our life over to Christ, invest our relationship in Him. That means to grow in His word. You know, I love the word of God. I love the word of God. I've been asked so many questions this past week. Marty, what do you think is going to happen in the world? I had a really good conversation with someone this past week who said the Word of God is irrelevant. It doesn't make any sense. It has no bearing on today. And I took them to Scripture and showed them prophetically what's happening in the world today is exactly what the Word of God said was going to happen. No question. And it's like they were in awe. Really? I said, yeah. I said, if you'll just open up the book, it's a blueprint for your life. 
It tells us how to raise our children. It tells us how to be a good husband and a good wife. It tells us how to be a good business person. It tells us how to be a good employee and employer. It tells us how to be a good citizen in this country. I mean, for example, last week I shared with you as we were talking about in God we trust, it doesn't matter what you think of any politician, the Word of God commands us to pray for them and to pray that God would change their heart to, to follow into the moral code and the values that the Word of God has for each and every one of us. Amen, church? So opening up the Word of God is so important. It's more than just a Sunday morning. Again, investing in the Lord. Here's the next one, M. T-I-M. March. March with the Lord. March with the Lord. What does that mean? I put out something on Facebook today. I said, I wonder how many folks will be in the house today. I mentioned that to you a moment ago. And when I talk about being in the house, I'm talking about being in worship together. You know, if there was ever a time, now if you disagree me, disagree with me, just come tell me. If there was ever a time to take a stand as a follower of Jesus Christ, it's today. It's today. It's the time to take a stand for the moral code and compass that we need back into this country. Amen? If there was ever a time to take a stand for that unborn child, that over, what? Over 625,000 a year, their lives are taken. If there was ever a time to take a stand for the moral compass of this country, now is the time. March for the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, one of the things when I read that, as I, I see what the Apostle Paul is speaking of, when he says to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you need to understand something about soldiers. Yesterday, we had the blessing. I went on a, on a motorcycle ride, and it was in honor of all the fallen heroes of the Twin Towers, and also those heroes there at Benghazi. And the many veterans across our country who have given and sacrificed of their life for the very freedoms that we enjoy here in this country. It was an incredible ride. Well over 100 plus motorcyclists went and, and we had a great time. And it, we just had a wonderful time of fellowship, wonderful time of food. But each and every place that we went at, at those memorials and the courthouses to place those, uh, those um, placards there, those signs there in honor of them, there was a time of prayer for them. Uh, there was a time to honor their service and their lives. But there was also a time of hope and realizing that we are a nation, the greatest nation on the face of the earth, who has done far more than any other nation. Nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing to be embarrassed for. We're always the first one in, the last one out. Because we are a nation under God. And I pray that we become a nation under God more than we have ever been before. And how is that going to happen? That's realizing that we must take a stand. And I thought about those soldiers. And then as I saw this description that we're giving here to be a soldier of the cross, one thing about a soldier that's very important, well, actually several, that we must understand is this. A soldier is what? Notice that I have it there. A, sword, a soldier's loyal. He is committed. Amen? He is committed. To a soldier in this country is committed to the United States of America. And a soldier for Jesus Christ is a committed follower of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means we're willing to take a stand. Notice I have in there, it says that we're loyal. We deny himself or herself. You know, I, I don't know about you, but if you're a soldier and, and uh, they tell you to go do something, what do you do? You go do it. Because if you don't do it, what are you going to do? What's going to happen? You're going to find yourself in the brig, Right? So you are taught to not only be a good soldier, but you're taught, taught to deny yourself. Well, I don't want to go do it. I, why would I ever want to go sleep on the dirt, right? Why would I ever want to do that? Why would I ever want to walk into a building with people shooting bullets at me? Why would I ever want to do that? It's because you've learned how to deny yourself. Deny your desires. You know, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we have to learn how to deny ourselves. You know, there's a lot of things... Probably this morning, one of those things you wanted to deny was getting up early, getting dressed, and coming here, right? Oh, if I could just sleep in another hour, right? Sometimes it's the most difficult thing to do is just deny yourself some sleep. There comes a time as a follower of Jesus Christ, we have to realize that we need to deny ourselves to follow him. Someone posted, I mentioned it last week, someone posted, well, it's important that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to vote your conscience. Let me tell you what, I don't vote my conscience because my conscience will lie to me. My conscience will become sometimes my earthly desires, those things that I want. 
The reality is, is that I need to vote or I need to apply my life as it relates to the Word of God. And there are things in here that I have to not deny myself of. You know, the Apostle Paul says that we strive every day. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says we are to deny what? Deny ourselves every day. We need, to, we need to die to ourselves every day. He says, brethren, listen. He says you are to live your life, what? Holy and righteous, which is acceptable to God. How many of us strive every day to be more like Christ? How many of us strive every day to change? Lord, I love that song, Change My Heart, Oh God, Make It Ever True. What a great song. It's a scriptural song. We pray every day, Lord, change my mind, change my heart, that I might be more like you, denying ourselves. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says this, The things which you have learned from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach them to others. So in this word, march, listen, parents, those that are in here, your responsibility is that gift that God gave you, that child. And he has entrusted you to train them to share with them about the goodness and the greatness of Jesus Christ in their life. I shared with you last week, the Word of God says, train up a child in the way they should go, and he will not depart from that. You see, you have been entrusted with that gift to raise that child to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, let me break this down for you as Christians. For those of you that claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what you have been entrusted with? You have been entrusted with your faith. You've been entrusted to share your faith with others. How many of us are marching on and sharing our faith with others? Listen, I'm not talking to... You know, I think so many times folks get, get so worried that they've got to walk around. I, I call this the big gun. This is, this is one of the biggest Bibles I have. And let me tell you something. If I whack you upside the head, I could probably knock you out with it. All right? You ready? Now listen, it, it's not about walking around and just... You're dying and going to hell. Whap! You know? That's not what this is all about. You know what it's about? It's walking around and letting Jesus shine through me. It's walking around and showing and sharing the love of Jesus Christ by how I live my life. It's walking around with that moment and that opportunity avails itself as it did the other night when we were at the Deer Lodge. And we looked over at, uh, I just drew a blank on her name. Anyway. Honey, I knew you were going to speak it out to me, and she, she's staring at me, scratching her head. Anyway, we looked over at that young lady as we were sitting there, and, and, and we had already prayed, and we looked over and says, oh, no, we hadn't prayed yet. I'm, I'm losing track because we pray with so many at restaurants, and we asked her if we could pray for her. That opens up an opportunity. Number one, it lets them know that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And number two, my goodness, you would really pray for me? Absolutely. Just that moment to plant that seed of Christ, Showing and sharing the love of Christ, marching on as one of his soldiers. Amen, church? And when that opportunity avails itself to open up the Word of God, of course, as a follower of Jesus Christ, what else do I do? The Word of God tells me that I should have it within my heart. I've already quoted several scriptures to you that I know. I've memorized those. One of my favorite verses, it's the, it's the gospel in one verse. And I can share that verse with everyone. You guys should be able to do it too. John 3, 16. I would pray that everybody here at Fellowship of the Hills knows that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, listen, that's, that's you, that's me, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That one verse, I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with that person. Amen, church? So I need to march on as a good shoulder. You know why? Because I've been entrusted with this faith to share the goodness and the greatness of who Jesus is. All right, so that is what? That is M. Turn to Jesus Christ, invest in the Lord, and march with him as a soldier of the cross. And the last but certainly not least, this is a very important word. It's the word endure. I don't know about you, but have you ever wanted to quit? I remember my first year, my freshman year in high school playing football. Uh, Y'all remember two days. Did anybody ever have two days? Mine was in South Florida where the temperature is like 90 plus 100, and then it's 90 plus 100 in the humidity factor. It's like being in a boiling kettle, if you've all ever been out at two-a-days. And two-a-days usually start at 8 o'clock in the morning is your first two hours. And then we would go at the hottest time of the day. How do I know that? Because I took a weather course in college. The hottest time of the day is 4 p.m. That's the hottest time. That's, and I won't go to the scientific part of that, but that's when the earth's crust gets hot. Blah, blah, blah. But anyway, 
So we would have it at 4 o'clock. And, and I remember the first day at football practice, 8.30 wasn't so bad. 4 o'clock came, guess what happened? Marty wanted to quit. I had already had enough of this. But I wasn't going to quit because I didn't want to what? Huh? I didn't want anybody to look at me, oh, you quitter. You couldn't take it. You couldn't handle it. So I stuck it out. And then I ended up sticking it out all through high school because I didn't want to quit, right? But how many of us have wanted to quit? Just give up. And sometimes as a follower of Jesus Christ, when we see what's happening here on this earth, when we see what's happening right around us, we say, Lord, man, I just, I just want to quit. I just want to give up. I mean, is, is it going to get any better? Do you know how many times those great followers of Christ probably asked that question? Is it going to get any better? There was one who's my hero, the Apostle Paul. I shared it last week. I just have to believe that he was one of those when he would walk into any, any of the villages to share Christ. Again, he wasn't looking for the best hotel. He knew that he was going to probably one day end up in prison for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he never gave up. He never quit. In fact, the Apostle Paul, if you read his story... You read his story where he was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was left for dead. And what did he do? I don't know about you. I'd have probably just rolled over and said, Lord, I'm ready to go. What did he do? He got up and he marched on. He endured. Why did he endure? Why did he endure? Why did he never give up? Because he knew this wasn't it. This wasn't the end for any of us. Remember I talked about time. We're in a time right now with COVID and everything else that's been going on. And if we're not careful, we just quit. We just give up. We just kind of hunker down and say, well, this is the best it's ever going to be. And I'm here to tell you it's not. I'm here, to, I'm here to tell you in Jesus Christ, there is so much more for you. How many of you look for the blessings in each and every day? How many of you are saying, well, Marty, I just wish I could find a blessing in each and every day. Well, let me give you one, one simple blessing that you have for today. I want you to stick your hand right here. All right? Can you feel it? It's that stuff that's going in and out of your nose. That's called the breath of life. That's a blessing. You didn't have to have that this morning. God gave that to you. That's a blessing. Guess what? Hey, I want you to look up here. This handsome dude in this purple shirt, you got a blessing this morning. You got to see me. Amen? Now, come on. Let's have some fun with this. The reality is, is if we're not careful, we miss out on the blessings that God has for us. You know what? I'm going to go out to eat in a little bit. I'm thankful that the Lord has provided the funds for me to take and my beautiful bride and, and a guest that I have with me this morning to go and have a nice dinner. Amen? You know what? I'm thankful for those who will take the time to make that nice dinner for me. Amen? A blessing. I'm thankful that when I go outside here in just a moment and I put that key in my pocket, and that's the most amazing thing to me, that I can walk up to that car, get in and push a button, it knows I'm here. <laughs> Amen? You know what's even funnier? Is when I don't have the key, and Susan does, and I drop her off, at a, and then the car starts ringing, key's not here, key's not here. I'm going, oh no, what do I do, what do I do? You know? Isn't that amazing? You know, I'm blessed. You're blessed this morning. So I can endure anything in Christ. The Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Notice this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, it says, But he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. You know, to, to us as followers of Jesus Christ, never give up, never quit, never quit, never give in. Hold fast, don't get discouraged, don't let things shake you as I wrote here in this second line. Uh, when shaken or discouraged or in despair, we can turn to Christ and we can hold fast to our faith. We can hold fast to the promises that God has for us. We can endure in the Lord, no matter what happens. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Now, I will tell you this, as a follower of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live, there will be suffering. And probably as evident as I have seen it is what's going to probably take place this week with the Supreme Court Justice nominee. She is already facing what? Persecution for her faith. We live in a time in which persecution of our faith is imminent and it's present. At one time in this nation, that was not the case. 
at one time to hold the banner of the cross, to stand for Christ as a nation under God, would be something to be proud of. We live in a different time and a different era. And the Word of God is very clear as we continue to live this life. Don't have any fear because you will face suffering. You'll face persecution. How many of you today, how many of you today, if you were to be put on, a, put on trial, there'd be enough evidence to convict you as a follower of Jesus Christ? Or you'd have a prosecutor that would stand and say, oh, no, we don't, we're not going to prosecute this person. We can't find any evidence to say that he or she's a Christian. Boy, how sad that would be. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you in prison. I shared with a man just, I, I don't know if it was last week or two weeks ago, I've begun to lose track of time. And I said, all right, guys, I hear all the time how you guys love me and you care for me. But, you know, as time continues to move on and things begin to change in this country, should there be a time that someone walks through that door and says, Pastor, you need to sit down. You can no longer preach the Word of God. You know your pastor is going to stand up. And I said, how many of you go with me? Now, they all said they'd go with me. And I'm not sure if they meant they would go with me to help get my bail or they would go with me to make sure that I was going to be taken care of or would they go with me because they would take a stand for Jesus Christ. You see, there may come a time, Marty, that would never happen in this country. Really? Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. But be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. I challenge each of us as followers of Jesus Christ, there may come a moment and a time that you need to take a stand and to endure and to be that follower of Jesus Christ and understand that suffering may come. But rest assured, his hope and his promise is true. And we truly can find the joy of the Lord that will be our strength. As the Apostle Paul said when he was in prison, he said, man doesn't matter whether I'm here. He, doesn't, he said, listen, it doesn't matter whether I die or whether I stay. He says, I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to give it my all. And right there while he was in prison, he was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. I love what John MacArthur said last week when they were coming there and they were talking about, um, you know, closing his church down there in California and they may have to, to you know, send him to jail. And John says, well, that, that, that might be a good place to go because I can start a prison ministry there. Amen? So you, you've got to find the blessings in where God has you and never look at it as suffering. Well, I want to close with this one slide here, and I, I do pray that you take note of it as we close out the day. Notice what it says right here. To turn our nation back to one nation under God. The first place is to turn your life over to Jesus Christ, where you can make a difference in your home. You can make a difference in your community. You can make a difference in this country. And as we've already seen, we can make a difference in the world. I love what Jonathan, Jonathan said there in his humility. He says, listen, don't, don't thank me. Thank those who have sent me. Now think about that just for a moment. We're only one of many churches that supports the POWs, not only in prayer, but in finances. And I, you know what? Each and every one of us are sent. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm sent out into this world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You want to see things change in this country? It's about you taking a stand as a follower of Jesus Christ. And for that to happen, you have to know where your relationship is with him. Turn your life over to the Lord. Invest in the Lord. March for the Lord. And endure for the Lord. Will you pray with me? Father, I am thankful for the opportunity that you gave me this morning. I am blessed to be here. Father, I am so thankful to be able to stand in this room, in this house, and to publicly profess Jesus Christ, not only as my Lord and Savior, but you in which I follow. Because, Lord, there was a time that was not true. You truly changed my life. And my prayer is, Lord, that others, through the testimony of my life, through what you've done in my life, that, Father, they'll understand and they'll know that Jesus Christ can make a change in their life. And Father, for that promise of eternal life, that hope of tomorrow, the reality is, Lord, I, on this earth, I don't know what the next moment will bring because each breath that I breathe here on this earth is a blessing to be with my family. But Lord, I also know 
and I have no fear that when the last breath is taken here on this earth, Father, that moment, I'll be in your very presence with that gift of eternal life that's become a promise. And Father, as I live here on this earth, I pray, Lord, that you will give me the strength, the wisdom to live a life for you and to share the goodness and the greatness of who you are. And that's my prayer, Lord, for each person in this room and watching us online who professes to know you as their Lord and Savior. They call themselves Christians. And Father, I pray that if there was ever a time to take a stand, to march and to endure the hardships that may come, that Lord, it's a time now to stand for Jesus Christ. Lord, the nation, our nation, a nation at one time that was called a nation under God hangs in the balance. It's not about a person. It's not about a party. Father, it's about those that claim you as their Lord and Savior to take a stand and to make a difference as they once did over 200 years ago. Father, I truly believe that we can still be the greatest nation on the face of this earth because we are a nation under God. A nation of grace and mercy. A nation of forgiveness. A nation of hope and peace. All of which, Lord, we find in the Word of God. Attributes of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ should be the attributes and the character traits of who we are as a nation. So, Father, that is my prayer. And, Father, if there's one in here this morning, Lord, as the Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart, Father, I pray that they'll open their heart and accept you as their Lord and their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.